evidence. All right, so today's discussion is about how to cut evidence. And I'm gonna use Zoom because when you teach students how to cut evidence, you it is definitely a showing and doing simultaneously or they really struggle to understand a lot of the things that are tied to ethical evidence. Um, and in debate there, like I said before, there are very few rules of debate. <laughs> Everything is a pirate's code in debate, except uh, there are only a couple of hard and fast things. First, there will always be a decision. It will never, almost never be overturned. You can pretty much just count on never overturned by the tavern, but there will always be a decision. Even if all four debaters argue there should not be a decision in debate, a decision will be made. If the judge refuses to make a decision, uh, the tab room software will automatically toss a coin and assign a winner in the debate. So there will always be a decision. All right, so that's the first rule. The second rule is evidence. Um, ethical evidence is um, the backbone of policy debate, right? So it is essential that when your students are cutting evidence that they follow the rules of evidence production. Um, if an opponent cannot find evidence that your students have, right? Like they can't locate it anywhere. It could become um, an actual ethical challenge. And the result is not just that your students would lose the round, it's that they would be removed from the tournament. They would likely be reported to your school, like especially as like, it's gonna go up the chain, right? Like, so a coach is gonna try to look for the evidence if they can't locate it, then they'll probably hand it off to a, you know, a, a tab room or debate expert to look for the evidence. And in a world where many people decide this evidence has been fabricated because it cannot be located, um, this is like one of the highest breaches of debate ethics. So uh, BYU does not have a debate team because it fabricated evidence in the 70s. BYU is a religious university. It's like one of the foremost, it's like up there with Liberty in terms of we have been created so that people in of the uh, Latter-day Saint faith can go to college and not be, um, you know, brainwashed by the liberal institutions of the university. Uh, they do not compete in debate or speech anymore because they were caught fabricating evidence in the 70s and the debate community uh, banned them, right? They served a ban. And then the university decided that if debate was so competitive that it would cause ethical God-fearing students to cheat, then it was um, not an appropriate forum for their students. And so BYU has not had a competitive debate team since, since the ban. Um, so it is a very serious thing. And the tab room, uh, it's not just that you're going to lose the debate. It's that you're going to be removed from the debate tournament. Um, and it will probably cause complications at your school, which is very, very serious. Because, uh, uh, you know, debaters do lots of wild things that don't cause that degree of complication at the school. Okay. So what we're going to talk about then is how to produce evidence, right? Um, and, uh, you know, what evidence is, I mean, evidence is really just proof. And in policy debate, um, if it's controversial, we cite some sort of written proof. So yes, it is true that like an example that you know about, right? Um, if I was like, well, COVID is an example of a disease, it could kill us all. Okay, do I need to read evidence that says COVID is an example of a disease, it could kill us all? No, is that proof? Yes, it is. But is it as good of proof as a piece of evidence that says that there's another mutating strain of COVID and that we need to have infectious disease protection, right? That is much more controversial, all right? And probably would be better supported by an expert or some sort of objective explanation. So one of the reasons that we cite evidence um, and that we so actively go read and process articles and that you see such an evidence heavy form of policy debate is because it provides us proof. Um, the second reason, which I think is frankly 
the most important, <laughs> second most important, whatever, on par, on par with having data um, is evidence provides reasoning. Um, reasoning that I don't have access to, things I don't know about, right? Uh, you know, I had a debater, <laughs> a debater, uh, this guy in particular, he was really allergic to evidence. He was not a fan of it. And he came to my office and he actually asked me if I just didn't have any opinions of my own. And that's why I was so um, focused on evidence. And I looked at him and I said, truthfully, I don't know a lot of things in the world. Like a lot of the things that we debate about, I'm not an expert in. They're not my field of study. I went to, I, my master's degree is in communication. So, you know, if you want to ask me about Aristotle's the rhetoric, bada bing, bada boom, I got you. It just doesn't come up very often in everyday conversation. And it's not super useful in a lot of debate rounds to be like, but let me break down what pathos meant, right? That's not... It's not useful in my intellectual property rights debate. I'm not an intellectual property rights expert. I'm not an intellectual property rights lawyer. I don't sit around having those conversations for funsies. And as a result, reading evidence gives me a lot of ideas about what is relevant to those conversations. It doesn't just provide me with proof. It also provides me with reasoning and it sparks a lot of my own innovation and idea creation. So I am a... I, I am of the belief that um, the literature will tell you what the debate is supposed to be about. Um, and if you have an idea and you can't find any literature on it, it's probably not a great idea, according to experts in the field, or, or you just haven't found the right keywords because you don't speak their language yet. And when you do find the right keywords, you will then find the research that you're looking for. So, for example, when we're having a renewable energies debate, um, I know that there are problems with solar power because the sun does not shine all of the time, right? And that you can't just put solar power everywhere because some places are really kind of gloomy and dismal most of the year. Uh, they're not all Southern California. And that means that solar power is not going to work very well. But in the renewable energy literature, that's called intermittency, intermittent power, because you have to be able to store solar power when it is really sunshiny and it is like there's tons and tons of sunshine, um, it overloads the power cells. So you have to be able to capture a surplus of the power because solar is, our solar power is intermittent. Um, but until I started doing research, I didn't know it was called intermittency. So I'm just out there looking for gaps in solar power. Uh, it took a little while to find the right words. Once I found the right words, I started searching for those words evidence fell from the heavens. I was like, oh my God, this, I, this is obviously the problem I thought it was. There's a million experts talking about whether or not solar batteries can store enough power uh, because of intermittency or to resolve intermittency. Okay. So sometimes it's really just about finding the right language to find uh, your research. Okie dokie. So uh, when we're doing research, what kinds of research are we doing? It's such a fine question. All right, I'm going to use a, a whiteboard here for just a second. Let's see, I've not used the new Zoom whiteboards since they got fancy because I haven't had to talk or I haven't had to teach on Zoom in a minute. That's much better than I want it to be. All right, um, so when are we researching? Right, that's a really good question, right? Like, Tony, when am I even going to be doing this with my students? All right. Um, so sometimes, oh, can you write on the whiteboard too? Yeah. I don't know. You can look at that. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, I can clear the whole page. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> signed in a lot of control okay nope. it's being weird okay hang on i got you i got you oh here it is oh too late <laughs> i did it <laughs> okay uh here let me do this one when are we researching all right such a good question all right so there are a couple of times that you're researching when you have varsity debaters all right uh, you start the season 
by building an affirmative case. All right, you start the affirmative, you start the season by building an affirmative case. Um, this is uh, probably one of the most important things that they'll do. And when they go to fancy debate camps, this is exactly what they start by doing. Uh, now, you might have debaters who are, I have already looked through the big pile of evidence available for you on the open evidence project, and they don't need to write an affirmative case from scratch. That's perfectly fine. We love that for them. Um, but they are going to need to uh, fill the gaps of an affirmative case. Um, and this will be true uh, even in Lambda. They'll still need to go fill the gaps. All right. Uh, and um, they will also need to um, select negative arguments and fill those gaps. So it is possible that if they feel like, oh, no, I've got everything from camp, that they're not going to do any research <laughs> until after the first tournament when they discover the gaps, because <laughs> nobody will teach you your gaps better than your opponents. <laughs> um, but there are a couple of things that are always gaps. So the first is uh, uniqueness on disadvantages. It's always a gap. Um, uniqueness is a description of the status quo. It's a description of right now. And so it is literally out of date before every tournament. Every tournament, uh, the week of the tournament, like the Monday, if you're going to go to a tournament on Friday, the Monday of the tournament, all of your disads should have new uniqueness cards, which means you have to go find new evidence that says the exact same argument as the evidence you already have. That has to be from the week of the tournament. Um, this is just, it's a necessity um, because if they don't do it inevitably, they will find that other debaters have done it. Um, and uh, what will happen is the, the, the their opponent right? Affirmative teams will say, um, well, our evidence says that your evidence is wrong and our evidence is literally just more recent than yours. It's more descriptive of the current situation. So if they have done evidence, if they have at least one piece of evidence from the week of the tournament, they will be ready to go. Even if they don't change the disadvantage shell to literally put the more the recent evidence in their one NC, having it ready to go um, in the second negatives or in the negative block, wherever they're going to debate the disad um, is a huge advantage for them. And um, I never go anywhere without updated uniqueness. I never go to a tournament without updated uniqueness evidence. The other thing that they will inevitably want, all right, we'll just see what happens here, um, is more link, more links uh, so there are going to be new affirmative cases that show up in your little league, in your little region, um, that they don't have link evidence to. Uh, and so they will need to go find evidence that says that that affirmative plan causes the disadvantage. All right, this is an inevitable part of disad debate and just like people being clever over the course of the year. All right, so these are the things that you will definitely have to start doing right away if you're a varsity coach. Um, and, you know, really in Lambda, that's what we're talking about here, right? Because we're we're not talking about cutting evidence for our novice or our JV. We're talking about what happens when they get to varsity. Now, if your debaters rise to varsity in the middle of the school year, um, you are not going to <laughs> create an affirmative case from scratch. That would be wild to do with like two tournaments left in the year. It's a ton of labor for very little result. You are going to go to open case list. Uh, you're going to let them pick a case that came out of camp that they are interested in and get to know that case. And then they are going to start filling gaps. They're going to do like the uniqueness work, right? This kind of work. This is the kind of work that you do. Um, but if you are at the very start of the season, then I recommend that you, if you can talk them into it, that you start by building an original affirmative case. 
right? That's when you start researching. All right. What is the other big type of research that all of the humans have to do? It is my literal favorite type of research named for the mob boss that it is. It is called a case hit. <laughs> And this is when you decide somebody's affirmative case must die. All right, a specific affirmative case must be beaten. All right, it is my favorite type of work. It's how you know you have made frenemies in debate is you have decided somebody has irked your soul so much that you will focus on their argument. All right, so I'm going to erase this part and we're going to go back to case hit proper because what is a case hit? All right, you're cutting evidence. We're going to talk about how you cut the evidence here shortly, but what is a case hit? It's such a good question. Case hit is my favorite thing in, in debate. Um, so a case hit is when we research a specific, and I, I mean, this is very specific. Why did you not, the other one's just expanded on everything. It's way larger than I want you to. A specific F case, which includes reading the F cards, well, articles, right? And then finding neg evidence specific to their uh, harms plan and solvency. Right? So it's, it's very, very specific. Um, which is what I mean by frenemies, right? That uh, you have uh, decided that this person's team cannot, we, we cannot, we cannot, they can't win anymore. They're beating us too often. They're winning the tournament all the time. Absolutely no. I cannot allow it for even another minute. So a case it is, it is very much, right? It's like, it's like I said, born of the mob. All right. When the mob takes out a hit, they don't just say, hey, there's a generic person somewhere in the universe we need to get rid of them. It's a specific person in a specific way, and they don't just wander in, right? Change oh, okay. Um, they don't just wander in, right? It is very well researched. They pause for just a sec. Um, you know, they know everything about that person. Right, they um, because they are planning very carefully, right? Uh, their process, and the same thing is true in debate. You are going to plan very carefully your process. So, in order to do that, you have to have a copy. Okay, this cannot be just a general discussion where you ask your team, hey, what did they say? And they're like, oh, they basically say, and they they like kind of restate it in their own words. That is not going to work. You need to have a copy of the case. Now, in order to get a copy of the case, your students have to save a copy when they debate them. All right. So when you are in varsity, the precursor to doing a lot of research is saving your opponent arguments. Here's a fun and important ethical fact. You can't actually use them. <laughs> so you can't like save, walk into the next debate round. I'm gonna use your argument now. Um, yeah, it turns out you can't, especially if that argument has like, their own written analytical arguments in it. Um, and you definitely don't want to use their evidence because you don't know if that evidence is accurate, right? And you're responsible. So what you're saying is 
when they come into the debate, uh, they have um, they're sharing the evidence, uh -huh. and everything. Obviously, you want to save a copy so you can debrief later. Yep. And uh, with your team before the next tournament to prepare, uh, but you can't go into the next actual debate right afterwards with that and try to. Yeah, I mean, you can't go into the next debate right. Unique arguments. Yeah, you can't just steal their unique arguments for your needs. Uh, you really can't even do it at the next tournament. But what you can do, let's say that they had a piece of evidence and you were like, this piece of evidence is so good. I need this piece of evidence in my life. Right. Okay. Uh, just take their citation and go find the evidence. Yeah. <laughs> take citation, find the evidence. And yeah. And then it's yours. Yeah. Right. As soon as you find the evidence, it belongs to you. All right. And any evidence that's on open case list, you can have free access to use. You don't need anybody's permission to use open case list evidence. All right. So if they're just using a file from open case list, take it and use it the next round. All right. Um, but let's say they've written out a bunch of their own analytical answers. No link. This doesn't really apply to our affirmative case because, and they have something clever. You can't, you can't take that. You can write your own versions of those arguments, but you cannot take word for word somebody else's like paragraph of writing. Um, is there a hard and fast rule that you'll get kicked out of the tournament? No. Uh, it's just kind of an ethical line that coaches hold about their students. Because if we all did that, then nobody would ever have to use their brain or write things out. We would just always use what everybody else has written around us. Um, and uh, we want our students to make those applications on their own, to think about it on their own. So I just tell my students, no, it's unethical. You can't use somebody else's analytical argument as they wrote it down. You can, you can take the idea write the idea down and use your own version. I love it when you use your own version. That's just called smart debate. It's not cheating. That's smart. Okay. Um, and so I will show you, let's close the whiteboard. Clear the whiteboard. I'm going to show you what that looks like um, in my little world here, what I've got happening. Uh, just so that you understand what I mean when I say, yep, okay. So here is my desktop, which I keep relatively clean because uh, so much debate stuff happens. And this is um, where my uh, um, debate stuff is. And this is when I say like my opponent's arguments, like as you can see here, Marshall Neg, right? A against our affirmative, Illinois SANE Act, I don't know if this is the best or I don't love my organizational method that I used last year, to be honest. I'm not a huge fan of what I ended up doing here. Um, but what I do is I keep it all year, right? So Central Michigan's affirmative and their answers to our negative argument. These are the answers they actually use in the debate round. Um, and then the keeping these arguments allows us to do case hits, right? So I can just open up Central Michigan's affirmative. And then the first step of a case hit is to read their articles, right? Because the best stuff tends to come from, from their articles, <laughs> right? Like just the things that they were like, you know, I didn't use that card because it's not my argument. Nope, but it is mine, uh, right? And so here's their little citation, right? And I just go find that article myself and I read it to see what it really actually says. Does it actually say that ICBMs have no strategic value at all? Or does it say that there are dangers to ICBMs? Does it say, but here are the reasons that we keep ICBMs? Yeah. So is there a reason to do this in case you face them again or a similar argument that you've actually read the article? Yes. Well, it is, it, it is for in case, but it's also because I almost certainly will. My debate team will, right? Varsity divisions are small and predictable. Uh you're going to debate the same people in varsity, the same schools over and over again, right? So um, I do this work because I know that we're going to debate them again, right? And then in my debate live, here's my 9 million folders. There's the hidden folders that you couldn't see, right? Here we go. Now, this is where I've done our stuff, okay? And so here we have Fullerton's case nags. Lots and lots of stuff in here. Um, and these are welcome to Case Hits Town. Case Nags are case hits. And here you go. Here's 
Central Michigan's eliminate the ICBM's case neg. All right, so this case neg is just designed to debate this Central Michigan affirmative. All right, and I will, uh, you know, show you the parts of that that are super relevant. So here's our little case neg. We have tons and tons of neg arguments, but here's what's important here. Central Michigan is this weird space junk advantage. All right, and nobody else was saying space junk. So we didn't have any evidence the first time we debated Central Michigan on space junk. All right. And I was like, this is an outrageously stupid argument that we are going to use decommissioned ICBM missiles to clean up space junk. Like what, what are we even going to do with them? Right. Uh, and so I went and I read what they had. And here's the problem with their stupid article. It's only one stupid person who in the whole globe who thinks that this should happen. And it's such a stupid idea. Nobody else is even willing to entertain it. But I don't think he had any. All right. There's not one. Look, you can see right here. It's just Washington Post. Not even an, there's not a human who's willing. That's what I mean. Like, Experts were would didn't even they weren't like even willing to write about it. There was nobody, nobody was even willing to write it was a bad idea because nobody was writing it was a good idea except this one stupid article. All right. Um, and I read the article and I thought, oh my God, I don't even know what to do with this stupid thing because there's not even anybody who really says that this is an idea that would work. Right. So I can't find people that say it's an idea that won't work either. Um, and I looked and I looked and I was kind of low-key enraged. Um, and so as I'm reading through their article, I was like, okay, wait, though. It does say that private corporations are going to take the lead on this, right? Um, that private corporations are going to be the ones that are going to do the real getting rid of space junk. And most, uh, you know, it's just like, okay, oh, the... The space community is going to buy them and then they're going to be the ones that uh, actually goes out and stops the space junk. And that's important because the affirmative doesn't have private companies do it. The affirmative has the government do it, which would mean the government would be taking away from those private companies industry. And then I found another article right below here that says, actually, the private companies will be better at it than governments will. All right. But this is very specific to Michigan because nobody else was even saying this absurd thing. All right. Um, also, as you can see, um, I have read their cards. And as I read their cards, I wrote in negative arguments, right? The unhighlighted part of their Ellsberg and Solomon evidence says that the U.S. has to eliminate launch on warning to solve accidents. But the affirmative doesn't do that. It only eliminates ICBMs, right? So their evidence says that more than one thing has to happen to solve their advantage, and their plan only does one of those things, right? So I'm writing in my re reasoning that I got from reading their evidence, right, into my case hit, All right? And this is my little case hit for Central Michigan, all right? And then, you know, we would read our regular disadvantage. Like we had a strategy that I always have a case strategy when I'm neg because case debate is where judges know that you're smart and not lazy. Case debates where they know that you do research, that you have take, taken the time to think about the other team um, and their case and not just read your generic economy disadvantage that applies to everything on this topic right, or read your generic politics argument about how the AF will make Trump the winner, Kamala will lose because the AF, how dare they? And that's that we call that generic, not because it's bad, but because you can cut link arguments where it applies to pretty much everything. Case debate only applies to the case you're debating. And it's how you show off to the judge that you are knowledgeable on the topic, right? It's your opportunity to show off your knowledge. And so even if it's not where you win the debate, you want to include it always in the debate because it makes you and your debaters look very, very smart.
right? It's like good for your credibility. So uh, that's what I mean by case hit. And a lot of the research that I do during the school year is basically maintenance of my argument. Like, oh, uh, the world changed. A new war broke out. It probably messes up my disadvantage. So I'm going to go do some research to prove that it doesn't mess up my disadvantage. <laughs> I'm going to go figure out how it doesn't mess it up. Because I don't want to have to make a whole brand new disadvantage argument that's very big. I mean, look at the size of the files that y'all have, right? That's a lot of original research. And I am not usually willing to do that in the middle of a school year uh, to start from scratch. Not unless it's winter break and I'm bored and I have a little itch. It's winter break. You know, I got a month to myself and I have nothing to do with my life. So I'm going to make a new argument sometimes. But that's about the only time I make a brand new argument once the school year has started. Most of the time, I'm just doing maintenance. I'm updating our uniqueness. I'm making sure that we have link cards, right? I'm making answers too. So when you're affirmative and the negative has a bunch of things to say, you'll need answers to those things. Um, and then I am doing case hits. Um, and that's, that's most of the research that I do during the year. All right. And now my friends, for the how we do the research. <laughs> All right. How we do the research. So once we've decided what we're going to research, um, the first thing is we want to be able to put it in debate um, format, in debate format. Uh, so when you're cutting and pasting from random intertubes, uh, random articles, uh, you know, PDFs, um, Google, you can't even cut and paste from a Google book. They've like, I don't know how Google managed to lock that down so well, but they really did. Um, I mean, I guess you can some of them. Anyways, it doesn't matter. Uh, PDFs though, um, and uh, websites, the formatting gets weird, right? When you cut and paste it into your Word doc, it does weird, weird things. So debate in its infinite nerdiness fixed that problem by creating its own version of a Word document that will help us standardize our formatting. Enter verbatim, verbatim. So this is verbatim. Uh, and if you just put it into Google here and search it, you get weird things, right? Like verbatim digital media sort, not that one. Here we are, paperless debate, verbatim per paperless debate. And your students, um, if they're at camp this week, they probably already have this because the lab leaders uh, in the scholars division will have made them have it. <laughs> All right. Um, but if it is the middle of the school year and you're rising, you don't have it. Okay. So you want verbatim. All right. And um, you just, it, you're just going to download it, download the latest version. As you can see, there's a whole bunch of versions down here. Uh, install for your PC, for your Mac, because Macs hate words. So that's a different problem. Um, but that's, this is how you get verbatim. All right, I cannot help you troubleshoot your verbatim problems. I am not good enough at that. But Joseph Flores, oddly, also the guy who runs this league, he is excellent at troubleshooting verbatim. He's your guy. Okay. So what does verbatim look like? Mm -hmm. Open some verbatim for you. Stop sharing this. And I'm going to open verbatim. Okay. Welcome to verbatim. So it really just looks like a Word doc, right? It's just a Word doc. That's all it is. Um, and uh, what it does is up here in the add-ins. It's the add-ins portion that's relevant of verbatim. This is where the, the stuff really works out for verbatim. So verbatim uh, is a debater's way of organizing files, right? It, it doesn't it doesn't just um, format them for you. It also helps you create an organizational structure and an organizational structure that you can use for debate rounds. 
and all varsity and college debaters use verbatim. So it's very standardized. And the result of it being standardized um, is that everybody uh, has, everybody can use each other's files pretty easily. Okay, sorry, just one sec, family thing, my bad. Okay. Okay. So this is verbatim for you, and it makes organizing your files very, very easy. Um, all of my files are organized using verbatim, and I'll just show you one real quick. Going back into my debate files. Oh, now they locked our door? Oh, that is going to be terrible. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean interrupt. Yeah, no problem. We locked our door. Ah, it's going to be a pain today. <laughs> okay. Sorry. I got to let, I'm just going to let. Sorry. Sorry, I'm going to get it right away. No, you're fine. Uh, Are you sure it works? Uh, yes. I just got to let uh, the tournament know that they are changing the batteries in the door and that is locking all the doors. fun for the tournament. All right, uh, so what does it look like when you use verbatim? Here we are, uh, this is my affirmative case file from last year using verbatim, all right? Um, and, you know, verbatim, like I said, verbatim organizes a file um, and makes it very easy uh, to, um, words are hard. Uh, makes it very easy to uh, uh, format everything. So um, in my verbatim add-ins, I don't know what they're doing. All right, uh, up here, up top, all right, uh, this is called a block, all right? And um, when I use this over here in the navigation pane, it's gonna collapse all of the evidence beneath it into my block and then uh, there are, is tag for tagline, and then when I use the the tagline designation, it's going to show up over here. All right, and then if I have cut and paste this in, well, I'm going to show you what it looks like when you cut and paste it in. But um, here you go. This is like a whole big file, and um, yeah. So we have a lot of stuff and it's a very handy way to organize your files. And like I said, all of the varsity debaters and all college debaters use verbatim, which is nice because it means everything's kind of standardized and it makes it very easy for us to share uh, our files like in rounds, like it's very easy to follow along. So, you know, this is like our bigger file here Right. And this is what block looks like. Right. So here's this part. And then on my navigation pane, I can just jump down to other blocks very easily. And I can see every card in my file because I can see the tag. Right. I can see the tag. And it, all I have to do is click on the tag in the navigation pane and it jumps right to that card. 
And as you can see there, every one of my cards look the exact same. And that's not because the internet or the PDF I took them from was the same. It's because I can clear the formatting and it makes them much easier to read and look at for debaters. All right, so it's not really just for prettiness, it's really for the ease of reading. Okay, let me show you what, it, yep. So my question is, does it, is it verbatim smart enough to take the article and make those summaries for you? It is or, not, you okay. have to make all the summaries. So you're, doing the work. you're doing the work, verbatim just formats it and makes it easier for you to move it around and organize it. And let me show you what I mean. Okay, so uh, what we're gonna do now um, is we're just gonna start with some evidence. Let's start with some evidence. All right, now um, we want to update our economy disad. Why not, right? That makes sense, uh, your economy disad um what the uniqueness evidence we're going to look at the uniqueness evidence from your economy just out here and i'm really going to see how many tabs i have open to really show all right so here's your economy disadvantage all right over here in the navigation pane is uniqueness all right so here we go uh, this is from, it just says Gibson 24. And if you look though down here, it's July 11th. That's really not very old, but it's August. It's August now. All right. Um, and if I was going to go into my first debate tournament, you know, what we all's first debate tournaments, what, probably the beginning of October, end of September, somewhere right in there. All right. That by the time you get to your first tournament, this evidence will be a couple of months old. And the economy really changes. As a matter of fact, um, the feds are reducing interest rates as we speak. All right, so the economy is changing right now. Okay, so we're gonna go look for evidence more recent than July 11th. All right, that's what we're gonna do. That's our assignment. We're gonna update our uniqueness cards. All right, now, uh, much like your students, I'm gonna go to my favorite lazy guy place to do this. There are several places that you can do this kind of research, but I like this because every high school debater in the country has access to Google News. <laughs> you know, um, college debaters have access to databases provided through their college that make research easier because um, it's like all in a nice handy little area and it's easier to search and find what you're looking for. High school debaters don't have that, but they all have access to the Google. So winning, off we go to Google News. So I want to look for um, inflation in the U.S. Uh, declining. That sounds like a word that I would want. All right. And, um, you know, just put it into Google News and hit go. And the reason I put it into Google News and not just regular Google is this does actually um, cut, filter out a bunch of crap, <laughs> right? So here we go. So up here, February 13th, that's much older. Okay, it's no good for us. Uh, July 12th, okay, it's a little bit newer. Okay, ah, inflation, Falling inflation, sturdy economy, happy Fed six days ago. Now we're talking. That's more recent, right? By a couple of weeks than our July evidence. All right. And then the Financial Times is like, is it okay if we track you? Um, it is not. Thank you. All right. And here we go. We have some evidences here. Okay. Um, oh, Donald Trump's going to end the persecution of crypto. I, I didn't really think it was being persecuted, um, but, you know, as an investor in crypto, uh, <laughs> that sometimes is, it costs me money. Anyways, um, inflation is falling and the Fed needn't rush. The economy's so strong. Somebody tell America because I don't think America knows. Um, on the, uh, left. Yeah, I'm saying, right? Like, why is this not the top of the Harris campaign? 
<laughs> Economy strong, even conservatives like the Financial Times think so. All right, so... Uh, as we're reading it here. Okay, so we want this here, right? The Fed. Uh, growth looks firm and steady in the face of current rate levels. That's why I've started there um, because there's a lot of places I could start this piece of evidence, but I definitely want that sentence. I want growth looks firm and steady. All right, that is as good evidence for me. Oh, too far. Too much Google, too much. All right, so um, I'm gonna try to make this cooperate for me. I might have to do it in two chunks. All right, so I'm just gonna copy it over. All right, I'm gonna go to my verbatim, which just give me one sec and I will swap over for you in a minute. Because I know that it's not going to just easily jump back and forth for me. All right, I'll head to my verbatim here in just a second for you. Okay, so I've cut from my article and pasted into my verbatim, right? So I started by, um, I started by uh, noting what I wanted to research, right? Like I said, okay, I'm going to look for cards for this. All right, so when your students go off to research, they have to have something they're researching. Everybody gets a research assignment. And when you have new young re researchers, put at least two on every research assignment because um, just the number of times that they come back and they're like, Tony, there's no cards on that. <laughs> I looked, I could find no cards. And I wanna be like, yeah, but you're also the same guy who can't find ketchup in your fridge. Like, and it's just right there, it's in the door. It's where it's literally been every day of its ketchup life, uh, but you couldn't find it. You had to ask your mom to come in here and find it. <laughs> so. Uh, I, you know, always put at least pair of young researchers on an assignment and then hope between them that a card returns to you. <laughs> okay. So here we have, uh, I just cut and paste it in. And as you can see, it looks ugly, right? Why does it look ugly? It looks ugly because, um, the financial times is so worried that I'm going to steal their content without crediting them that every time I cut and paste, they said, you got, uh, we're going to automatically insight that insert this shitty citation for you. Pardon my language, but it, it, it's not even a good citation, right? Like they didn't give the author credit at all. They just want their own credit. Uh, always Chrome. Always Chrome. Okay. So I've kind of fixed that part. All right. And then I'm going to take this. I'm just going to highlight it all. I'm going to hit clear. And now any weird parts of the article would go away, right? Like if, if it had like weird uh, size font in it, or if it was all different fonts or different colors, it would now all go black and it would all be the same standard font. Okay, before I tag it, I wanna cite it because when an article gets lost from its home, it literally never returns. Uh, it, I mean, not literally, but it is really hard when um, things get, uh, when we forget to cite something right away to find it later. Um, okay, so I'm going to cite it now. And as you can see, it immediately started doing weird things, right? Oh, which is funny because not that's not even really the right site. That's just like the headline site. That's the right site. There we go. See, look at that. Didn't even, in the headline site, they don't even include this second guy who helped write this thing and is the second author. All right, and then I want the Financial Times. All right, there's the article title. And I want the exact URL right there. 
Now, all of this is obviously cited all weird. So I'm going to click clear and that's going to get rid of it. All right, and I'm going to clear this part and it gets rid of that orangey stripe. Thank you. Now, the only thing it doesn't get rid of is it doesn't get rid of hyperlinks. So when I want to get rid of the hyperlink and I do often remove the hyperlinks because they're useless and just not. The last thing you want in the middle of a piece of evidence is a weird hyperlink. Um, I typically remove the hyperlinks before I clear the evidence because once you clear it, they're not in blue anymore. All right. So I've now cited my evidence, uh, removed the hyperlinks that are just my own pet peeve, um, and I need to tag my evidence. Okay. So how do I tag evidence? That's a hard question. A tag is an argumentative summary. Students epically struggle with tags. So um, if you are an English teacher who has ever asked somebody to summarize this passage, then you understand how hard it is for their brains. Like it just fully scrambles their brain to need to summarize a passage. Um, and that is what I'm asking them to do. And I'm not just asking them to summarize it. I'm asking them to summarize it in a way that is argumentative, that is useful to an argument. All right, now I know that I'm doing uniqueness updates, hallelujah. So I definitely going to call this block economy uniqueness, right? Because I know all of this evidence is supposed to be about a, the uniqueness debate for my economy DA, right? Or I could write uh, uniqueness, economy DA, whatever. As long as they can find it, it's fine. And you see how when I did that, I clicked block, it showed up over here in the navigation pane for me. All right, so in order, when I am tagging, um, I really like to have a good feel for the evidence. And so for order, in order for me to do that, um, I underline it um, is very helpful. Underlining is a very helpful way of um, knowing how you want to summarize the evidence. Okay, so in order to do that, I kind of got to read it a little bit. All right, um, I'm going to make it larger size for you, not for me, not because I'm old and need to see it. <laughs> I don't know how the kids look at this. This is small. I know I used to look at small, regular size font, but now it is very small. All right, so the uniqueness for my dissat is that inflation is falling. So I know that I've looked for evidence that says inflation is falling already. All right. Uh, so let's see, we have um, the next CPI and PCE inflation readings are far below are below the Fed's 2% target. We may indeed get a September cut. Okay, I got to tell you the truth. I don't know what a CPI or a PCE, Consumers. Consumer Price Index. All right, I love that. What's PCE? Do we know? Anybody? All right, well, recorded universe, maybe you know. I would Google it if I really was interested. Um, but I will say that if I include it, all right, it is going to be because when I talk about the evidence later, I'm going to say, look, my evidence cites the consumer price index and the personal consumption expenditure, right? Um, and my, that says that those readings are both below the Fed's target. But it doesn't really say that, right? It says if, if, if. Mm. Okay. So maybe no, maybe no to you, right? Cause so because of the if, the if, right? And I could look. Don't get me wrong. I could. Use it. I could just take out the if, right? I could say. The next readings are below, but that's not really what the article says. And I don't want, like, uh, I don't want to get called out, but mostly also, I just don't want to misrepresent what the author is saying because the risks are really high. I mean, look, the if is right there. It's the first word. All right. Um, and sometimes your debaters start to feel like kind of desperate for evidence. And they, they're like, I just pull the if out. It's like, it's what they meant. It would be like a code of evidence. Yeah, you kind of got to have like don't a, misrepresent. don't misrepresent what the author is saying, right? Like there's a lot of evidence in the world. Google has billions of pages for you. 
Don't you don't need to misrepresent it. You'll find what you want. So the risks of the Fed holding on a little longer are modest because growth looks firm and steady in the face of current level rates. Oh, I like that part. I still like that. Growth looks firm and steady uh, in the face of current rates. Yay. All right. Many observers on Wall Street and beyond are getting jumpy about the economy and worried the Fed might break something because they, they hold interest rates high too long. People flip out. Unhedged things need to calm down a bit. Let's go through the numbers. Okay. So I don't really need that stuff because my argument isn't that the feds are doing a good job. I don't need that, right? I mean, sort of, I am making that argument. It's like an implied part of inflation is coming down, right? Because the feds are helping us reduce inflation, but I don't need to like defend the feds. So I'm not going to underline that part. U.S. inflation is just about at the feds target. Oh, I do want that part because it had to have come down. The feds, was literally, they were literally trying to reduce it. That's their whole point. Core, June core CPI was notably low. Oh, look at that. The CPI is back in my evidence, All right? Recording a 1% month on month increase and a three month average of just below 2%. Um, I might leave it at notably low. I might go back and add that data. Let's see uh, what the rest of the evidence says. The Fed's Preferred inflation measure, the personal expenditure price index. So look at that. If I just read the evidence further, it would have been right there. Is almost as good, but not as quite. All right. So that's great. Uh, we'll take that. The Fed's preferred inflation measure is almost as good. It came in slightly above expectations at a 2.6% annual growth rate. The pattern is similar. We, we don't need things to get better. We just need the trend to hold. So I'm just going to keep, we just need the trend to hold. All right. Now, um, the reason I'm not going to include this 1% month-on-month increase and three-month average just below 2% um, is because the 1% month-on-month increase, because debaters don't know much about the economy, uh, the word increase in there is a little bit weird for them. And they're going to be like, well, you said it's still, your evidence says it's still increasing. Like, okay, but... It's not, my evidence doesn't say it's still increasing and that's bad. My evidence says that it's still increasing, but it's increasing at a much lower rate, which means inflation is coming down, right? Inflation is the rate of increase, um, but well, that's kind of complicated. Did you have something in the article about unhedged? Because if it does say who unhedged is. Uh, yeah, you know, it doesn't say who unhedged is. So I'm, I'm going to guess it's just some financial authors, but I have to look them up. Um, yeah, uh, you know, either way, what I have is two core um, readings that both are on the decline. All right, so now I have underlined my evidence and I'm going to come back up here and tag it. And I am going to tag it. Inflation is on the decline. We just need the trend to hold. Doesn't that sound great for a disad? Right? Why change anything? Why we why mess with anything? We just need the trend to hold. Like just don't touch anything right now. All right. And then I'm gonna highlight that so that I can turn this into a tag. And as you can see, the minute I turned it into a tag, it turned out over here on my navigation pane. All right. And then one of the things that we really love about um, verbatim is that will also help us with our sites. So I'm gonna take Armstrong right? And the word and, because I need and, there's two authors. And then I'm going to highlight writer and I'm going to click site again. And notice how now it's bolded those, but it didn't stick them in the navigation pane. So it's not messing up my navigation pane, but when I read this evidence, it jumps from the screen. And when it comes to uniqueness evidence, I don't need to read the year because uniqueness evidence is supposed to be recent. I want to read the month and day. So uniqueness month and day. Month and day. The only time I ever read the year on uniqueness evidence is when it's from the prior year. So if it was from 23, then I would just say 23. Because look how old it is. It's already eight months old. All right. Um, okay. So. But 
part of why I am updating is I want the judge and I want my opponents to know that my evidence is two weeks more recent than theirs, right? Mine better speaks to the economic trends right now. Now, somebody might say, Tony, this is so silly. What difference does two weeks make, right? That is a, actually not a silly question. It's a great question. What difference does two weeks make? Because sometimes the answer is nothing. Like sometimes literally nothing happened. It doesn't make any difference. Yeah. In this case, Kamala Harris joined the race in two weeks. And that would massively change economic predictors in the United States. Text messages for your donations. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. This is text messages for your donations have, have been uh, heading uh, for two weeks. They've been inundating you now. So in this case, two weeks made a huge difference in the future potential outlook of our economy. All right. And yes, massive political changes impact economic forecasts. Right. If they didn't, then why would we care if Trump is good or bad at economy? Right. Like we would, we wouldn't care. Right. The part where he is good or bad at economy tells you that who is running for president impacts our economic forecasts. Okay. So uh, this is how verbatim helps us organize things. It's also how we go through the process of cutting cards. Okay. So the real question is what have we learned about? Cutting cards. Uh, you don't have to use verbatim. You can use a Word doc. I will tell you, it is the formatting parts really are irritating. Um, that is sadly not pretend for us. Uh, the and um, verbatim also does some other things that are really useful. It'll turn it into a speech document for your students. Okay. Um, and because all varsity debaters and college debaters are using verbatim, once they have it installed on their computer, it just gets easier to use all the files that they find on open evidence. All right. So I would say it is a necessity, right? I have my college debaters who cut very little evidence download verbatim just because it is what's compatible with all of the evidence in our file. Okay. Okay. So what now have we learned about cutting evidence? So the first thing that we learned is that you need to have a direction when you go to cut evidence, right? That if you're just looking randomly on the internet for anything related to the topic, that's really hard, <laughs> really hard. You don't know what you're looking for. So cut evidence with a purpose. We are looking for evidence about this, or we are reading the affirmatives articles to find things that contradict them or find things that don't fit their affirmative case so that we can cut that evidence and say, look what your author also said, sucker, all right? Um, because if their author doesn't agree with their plan, that's kind of important. Right, it means that their solvency evidence isn't really talking about their plan, and it it is very very common for the author of solvency cards to not agree word for word with the plan text. All right, especially when there's three or four solvency authors, you can usually bet that one of them deviated from this idea. All right, so we cut with purpose. We go look for things um, with a specific purpose in mind. Uh, we. Cut entire paragraphs, right? When I went to uh, cut and paste the evidence into verbatim, and I was like, I want to use this sentence that growth looks firm and steady. That was in this whole other paragraph. And the beginning of that paragraph started with if these things happen. And I was like, um, okay, I don't want the if part. But I still wanted that first sentence, which meant I had to include the whole paragraph. So could the other, my opponent, look at my evidence and say, well, your evidence does also say that this isn't a certainty. Because it does. It says it's anything but a certainty. Right? Yeah, they can say that about my evidence because that is in my evidence. Um, but my evidence are by people who are making economic predictions and they do not ever speak in certainties. That's just the nature of how people making economic forecasts speak. So they are not speaking in certainties. What they are saying is all the evidence is indicative 
that the trend is going in the right direction, which is why they don't say, yeah, for sure, inflation is about to be solved. Instead, what they say is this is a similar pattern and we just need the trend to hold, right? So they're not trying to speak with certainty because they're just trying to say we should we need the current trend to stay on chart, on path. And they don't have to speak with certainty, right? And part of the reason I feel confident saying that is because I actually read my own evidence as opposed to somebody handing my evidence to me. If somebody's handed my evidence to me and they read the part back to me that was like, well, but your card says it isn't anything like certainty and it shouldn't be. So doesn't that mean that they're not certain, right? Because I didn't actually cut this evidence. I might not feel as confident looking at them and saying, yeah, my evidence isn't talking about certainty. It's talking about trends and about holding the trends, right? So once I start cutting down evidence, it does really increase my confidence in me knowing what it says. All right, so I feel like a lot more capable of defending it. All right, so I cut it in entire paragraphs and then I made sure that I formatted it, right? Um, formatted, cited, right? I immediately went and cited the evidence because once it, the evidence, like if my browser closed <laughs> and I had to go find this article again, oh, it sometimes is easy and sometimes it is not, especially when what you took is out of a PDF in the giant universe of PDFs in the world, it, it, you might never find the right source again. Um, so I immediately cited it, right? And then I underlined, right? While thinking about what the purpose was, and then I tag the evidence, all right? And that is what I did to cut my evidence. All right, voila, you have evidence. Evidence cards have now been made. Um, and then obviously, you know, I save, you, you already saw, look at my system, I, I would then save my file. So I'm just gonna show you very quickly how I organize my files. And um, what I've discovered is that your debaters are allergic to organization um, because my debaters are allergic to organization and they get to college. And um, I'm like, okay, well, we've got all of these files, right? Um, which is basically just an individual Word document. And I need you to organize them. And they're like, yeah, I got them all, Tony. No problem. Uh, so we get to the first tournament. It's always happens. It's always the first tournament. I got to remember to ask myself to look at all of their organizational processes before the first tournament. Uh, get to the first tournament. And I'm like, okay, man, where's the file? Open it up. And he's like, uh, hang on, just give me a minute. Give me a minute. I was like, I got it. I got it. And I'm looking over because it's taking so long. Why is it taking so long? Well, I just, I'm trying to find it. It's, it's no big deal. It's like, what? what do you mean you're trying to find it? How hard could it be? Right? You just like open up the folder you put it in. Man. Uh, well, uh, yeah. I mean, I don't really use folders. Um, and they have literally saved everything on their desktop. And their desktop has 300 documents from the last four years of high school, plus everything that they've done for the first month of college saved on the desktop. You just ask document tiles uh and i was like what are you doing or they leave everything in their downloads folder like it just stays there like a downloads folder is a permanent home for them i was like that's not that's not a home man that's for things in transit that's like saying the train stops your home it's not you get off the train there and then you go to your home so they don't know how to organize um so uh, part of what I have to do is show them how to organize. So I'm just gonna show you what my file system looks like. All right, uh, I'm gonna show you what I look like on my laptop and I'm gonna show you what I look, what I use for my team. All right, um, because obviously they're not getting personal access to my laptop. <laughs> we're, not, we're not sharing at that level with each other. Okay, so here's this. This is like all my stuff. 138 is the name of the speech and debate class. So that's where I house it. I have everything organized by my courses here. All right, here's everything related to debate. And then inside of that are all of these topics that I've worked. So 
as you can see, I did political campaigns. We did the carbon tax, God help us all. Um, we did Supreme Court term limits, which actually turned out to be awesome. That was actually a super fun topic. Um, and last year was nukes, nuclear weapons. So uh, in here, I have AF and NEG. Makes sense. <laughs> Two sides of the debate. Not the same thing. AF files. So here we have my AF files. These are different versions of our first affirmative constructive. And you can see there, some of them are dated based on when I created them. Um, and, you know, I, I update before our tournament. I may be updated too many times last year, to be honest, for novice. They really seem to struggle with updates. Um, and then uh, down here are, here are my answers too, right? AT, answers too. And uh, these are all of our affirmative answers to our negative arguments that we heard this year. All right, so as soon as we heard an argument, um, I made answers to it. Um, the rule of my debate coach, the great Dr. John Brushke, who ran the Cal State Fullerton team forever and ever, just for like 30 years. Uh, he, his rule was any debater at any level can lose to an argument the first time they hear it. Doesn't matter how great you are, the first time you hear it, you know, it's perfectly reasonable to lose to an argument. You haven't even had a chance to think about it yet. But the second time, that's on you. The second loss is your fault, right? Because now you had a chance to go get prepared. Um, and either your answers weren't good enough, which is fine. You just go work harder to make them better or you didn't do the preparation to get ready. So the first time we hear an argument, right, I write it down and then we work on it as a team. Sometimes I work on it as a coach, like at the actual debate tournament, because at the debate tournament, the debaters are too busy debating to do lots of research and evidence work. So I will do that at the debate tournament, but between debate tournaments, they will do it. Okay. And then on the negative side, all right, these are our 1NCs. Um, and I different, there are lots of different versions of a 1NC on my team because I have different humans. So if you like the critique, then this nuclearism strategy is what you're going to use. And if you don't like the critique, then you're going to use this South Korea disadvantage and case debate because we always debate case. Uh, here at Fullerton College, always, it is mandatory, not optional. You will always have case debate arguments. And then these are our core negative files. And when these really get to be very big, and I have lots and lots of them, I will break them up by disads, um, counter plans, critiques. Last year's topic was actually kind of small, and it made it a little bit easier. I didn't have piles and piles of research. All right. But there are some topics. Right Here's political campaigns where I've got lots of stuff happening. So as you can see here, I have counter plans, disad, framework, critiques, topicality, and in each of these are different negative strategies. So when your student gets it in the match, are you pulling it from like tab room? Yeah. Saving it so let's see. That's a good question. So now uh, let's, um, so when they are sending me their, uh, when they debate an opponent, right, and they have their opponent's file, they email them to me. Oh, nice. They sit, shoot it immediately to me in a Gmail. It's actually um, at the end of the round, they have a couple of responsibilities. The first one is to listen to what the judge says and write it down. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the way that they do that is they take their flows because I have them flow on paper because I'm all, all my debaters debate on their laptops. So they flow on paper, fold your flows in half, write the RFD on the blank half of your flows. Write what the judge said, who won, who was the judge, write their name. Ken is not a person. There are a million Kens in the universe. And you know which Ken? All right, write their name. Round three is not helpful. Yes, I can go find it later, but that's unnecessarily work. You're literally sitting here with this judge. Write their name down. Also, learn their names. Stop complaining about people whose names you don't even bother to know. Learn their name. Write their name down. 
write down if they voted affirmative or negative. All right. And then write down all the reasons that they say they made that decision and any advice they give you and your partner for improving. So write it down. It really helps them process what's going on and complain less. <laughs> so they're emailing you. Um, and then the after they do those things, they immediately send me an email with all of the opponent files that were sent to them during the debate. And then even if I can't get to it right then, like I have it say, it's in my email, right? And then I take them and organize them. But also then they also have those files saved in their email. And sometimes very useful for them. Sometimes they'll be like, oh my gosh, I'm debating Michigan again. So I mean, I mean, I, I debated them in round one. So I'm just going to get out their stuff and look at it really quick. How brilliant. They send it to you. After round one, that's a little nice if you're already prepping there. Oh, I am already prepping theirs, but and that is that is once you get to the varsity division, that's standard operating procedure. Oh, okay. Standard standard operating procedure in varsity division and all of college debate is search and destroy twenty four seven. There's like a few I've had some. Yeah. Uh, what you can't do is send your debaters communication during the debate yeah between debates anything goes so what they send it to me during round one and then i sit and work on it right i just yeah. sit and work on it i can't send them an email that's like hey i know you're in the middle of the debate or i can't once the debate starts i can't send them an email that's like here's this right so i just work on it and i put it in our shared drop box and then whenever the round is over or they get to it they get to it and at the end of the round, I alert them like, hey, we those updates are done. If I even get them done in that time frame. I mean, honestly, that's, what's, you're talking about power squads at that point. That's like some USC level, Long really? Beach level work. Uh, yeah, because there's one of me and eight of them. <laughs> you know, and usually I have to judge. So... Yeah. Well, I'm judging. I, I can't. Mean, I'm judging, but when I was first observing, right? Like I would have some people look at me as if I'm you're spying. You. Oh yeah. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah. Is here, friend. I'm just. I'm a new coach. Yep. As long I'm as we don't text. No eye contact or <laughs> as long as we don't text during the round or email them or message them. Yeah. All it's is fine. All right, so I'm going to show you now where I put the files so that during the tournament, um, we have access to them. All right. Let's, um, all right. And um, so I will say that one of the ways that coaches like to do, uh, you know, making sure that they have a team set of evidence that everybody has access to um, is they like to use um, uh, Google, uh, Google Drive. It is very convenient um, and it's free and all of your students already have access to it. <laughs> Winning. So um, uh, I understand that inclination. Um, I don't like to use um, Google Files. Like, I just don't like Google Docs very much. Uh, not for, like, debate work, which is, like, very intensive. So I use Dropbox, but I do have to pay for it. Sad face. Oh, shit. I'm probably paying for this monthly. I need to go... Oh, change that crap sack. I just paid for this all summer. Well, I have to because it's got all my files on it. Anyway, I don't know. Anyways, uh, just had a whole financial moment right in front of you. I realized I had forgotten to do something. That, yeah. Yep. Payments that I forgot about. Okay. So here we go. We're going into my Dropbox. Um, and I like Dropbox because I can invite all of my students to it and I can also kick their butts out of it. <laughs> Um, I also like the fact that if they delete something, I can restore it and it will tell me who did it. <laughs> here. Yeah. Friend. Yeah, exactly. What are you doing to me? Why do you hate me so much? Because I work so hard. 
So uh, this is my Dropbox and you see it, it looks a lot like my um, personal files here, but uh, there are 20 members who can access these files on nuclear weapons, right? And here is our affirmative case side, right? Hello, affirmative case. Why didn't it want to go? No, I guess it's, there we go. Okay, so first affirmative constructives, second affirmative constructive overviews, which are like, it basically is a way of helping your students remember to extend their impact arguments. <laughs> right, write them out. Um, and then all the answers to the negative arguments. And as you can see, somebody has accidentally moved these random hypersonic and patriarchy stuff. That should be in the answers to the negative. Somebody's somebody's moved something. AT. Yep. AT. All right. And then on the negative side of the debate, right? All the really just it just broke down just like I would expect them to be able to get into it. Case debate attacks. And then here are all of our case snags. One of the things that I like about Dropbox is they can sort it by when it was modified. So this is the most recent modification is to this asteroids case neg. So if I put in something brand new and they are like, I don't know how to find it. Just search modify, dude. Like just literally look for the most recent file. Also, if I change a file, like let's say um, I'm doing, I'm updating no extinction. We're not going to go extinct as a people. Um, I've updated that on my little personal laptop and then I drop it in to Dropbox. It's going to replace no extinction, the old version with the new version. And um, I don't have to tell my students, oh, hey, there's a new version because all they have to do is click modified and it will show them, oh, this has been updated recently. Right, because it gives them the date of when I changed it. Um, and, you know, some of my students are like really smart and on top of their stuff. I remember talking to a student and I was like, um, you know, hey, this evidence is in there and I updated it, you know, make sure you have the updated version. And she looked at me and she was like, yeah, I know you updated it. I can see when it was modified, Tony. <laughs> it's like, I, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Yeah, fair. Thanks. All right, and so that's how I organize Dropbox. is really easy to use for my team. They don't have to pay for it. It's free for them. I'm the only one that has to pay for it, and everybody can use it. All right. There you go. Yeah, you can have your school pay for it uh, if you can get them to. Okay, and that is it. That's evidence. All right, we're done.